Hello, everyone. Uh, as uh, Panaz mentioned, I'm Robert Haas, and I work at EDB as the chief database scientist, which means I spend a lot of my time uh, hacking on PostgreSQL, and sometimes I also uh, talk to other people about hacking on PostgreSQL, or sometimes I end up helping some of our customers with really difficult PostgreSQL problems that they sometimes have. And some of those problems have to do with auto vacuum, which is what I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, this is a difficult talk to give in the sense that there are many talks that you could write about auto vacuum that would fill up the time that we have today. So I'm going to have to be uh, pretty choosy about which things I go into detail on and which things I just pass over. But I hope that you will uh, get some benefit out of the talk. So let's start by talking about how it works. In order to understand how it works, we need to first clearly understand the difference between vacuum and auto vacuum. So a vacuum is an SQL command. It performs certain maintenance operations. You can run it however you like. You can run it from PSQL. You can run it from PG admin. You can run it from any way you connect to the database. Auto vacuum, on the other hand, is a set of background processes that automatically run the vacuum and analyze commands for you. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about what each of these things do. Vacuum has three main things that it does. The first thing that vacuum does is it recycles space in your tables and in your indexes. So when some tuple is deleted, it's not immediately gone from the table. It's not immediately gone from the indexes. That space has to be reclaimed. Similarly, when you do an update, what you're really doing is deleting the old row and inserting a new version of the row. So once again, the space for the old version of the row is still consumed. That space needs to be recycled. Otherwise, your tables and indexes are going to get larger and larger and larger which we call bloat. Uh, and you won't like that very much because your performance will become very bad. It's not primarily about the disk space that is consumed. It's about the performance of the system. Another thing that vacuum does is it allows for the reuse of transaction IDs, or XIDs, uh, and of multi-transaction IDs, or MXIDs. For purposes of this talk, we're not going to explain exactly what these things are. But we're going to say that they're, they are a limited resource. There are only 4 billion transaction IDs. There are only 4 billion multi-transaction IDs. If you run out of transaction IDs, you will not be able to process any more write transactions with your database until that problem is corrected. If you run out of multi-transaction IDs, certain kinds of write transactions will be blocked until that problem is corrected. So running out of transaction IDs and multi-transaction IDs is very bad. And Vacuum is there to make sure that that doesn't happen. The third thing that Vacuum does is it updates something called the visibility map for tables. Uh, that makes future Vacuum operations more efficient, which is nice. Uh, but it also makes your index-only scans run at a good rate of speed. Uh, that's not as important as the first two things that I mentioned, because if your index-only scans are a little slower, that's not great. But it's better than if your database stops accepting write transactions or becomes huge. So what I really want you to take away from this slide is that vacuuming is very important. You can't skip it. If you skip it, your database is not going to work. Many people think that vacuum is the enemy, and it's something that you need to keep from happening. But what I like to say is vacuuming is like exercise. If it hurts, you're not doing enough of it. <laughs> Let's talk about auto vacuum. As I said, auto vacuum is a set of processes which arrange to run vacuum for you. There is an auto vacuum launcher process which normally runs all the time. And its job is to start the other kind of process which is the auto vacuum worker process. So the only thing that the auto vacuum launcher process really knows is which databases you have. And its job is to start up auto vacuum worker processes in each database on a regular basis. The auto vacuum worker then goes through your database, looks at each table, 
and decides whether or not a vacuum is needed and whether or not an analyze is needed. If it decides that a vacuum is needed, then it, or an analyze is needed, then it performs that operation then and there. Otherwise, it moves on to the next table straight away. So with that very brief introduction to what vacuum and auto vacuum do, let's talk about what can go wrong. There are basically two categories of things that can go wrong. Uh, one of them is that since auto vacuum is nothing else but a system for automatically running vacuum and analyze, if there's some issue with vacuum or analyze, then that's also going to impact on auto vacuum. In order to understand the other category of issue, we need to think about what we're hoping auto vacuum will do and what it's actually coded to do. As users, or DBAs, we hope that auto vacuum is going to keep our database running properly. Bloat should be low, plenty of XID should be available, all of those good things. But auto vacuum doesn't know about that goal. It's just a system for running vacuum and analyze automatically according to a set of configurable parameters. And that means that if those parameters are not configured in a way that is appropriate to the system, auto vacuum may think, everything is great. I'm doing exactly what I was told to do. But your goal of having the database work properly may not be achieved. So let's look at the first thing that I mentioned, problems with vacuum or analyze itself. Most commonly, the problems are with vacuum rather than analyze. And the reason for that is simply that vacuum is the more complicated of those two commands, and it tends to consume a much larger quantity of system resources. So when we have problems, they're typically with auto vacuum running vacuum, not with auto vacuum running analyze. Of course, there are exceptions. Uh, but what can actually go wrong? Well, when you run a command, it can always fail for some reason. So it might be that auto vacuum says, hey, it's time to run vacuum, and it runs vacuum, but it fails with some error. If that happens, auto vacuum will eventually retry that operation, but maybe it will again fail with the same error. If that happens, you can get into a kind of loop where you keep trying to vacuum the same table over and over again, but because the error keeps happening, nothing is getting any better. Another problem that could happen when you try to run really any command, but in particular vacuum, is maybe it will run forever for some reason and never complete. Well, if that happens, then that table is not getting vacuumed because the command is not completing. And possibly other tables are also now not getting vacuumed because if auto vacuum is busy looking at that table, then it's not looking at your other tables, perhaps. Or maybe instead of running forever, vacuum is just running for a very long time. If it runs for one week, well, that's almost the same as forever. It's not the same in terms of the cause. It happens for a different kind of reason, which we'll talk about. Uh, but the effect is pretty much the same, because one week is too long. The other thing that could happen is that maybe vacuum could finish successfully in a reasonable amount of time, but for some reason it doesn't really get any work done. And if this happens, you actually get a problem that's very similar to the case where vacuum is failing. Auto vacuum says, huh, well, that vacuum didn't do anything. Better try again. And if that happens, then again, you're in a loop. You're using up resources over and over and over again, trying to vacuum the same table, and it's not helping. So those are problems executing the vacuum command. But what problems can occur in auto vacuum itself? Actually, this list is quite short. Auto vacuum itself is very reliable, provided that you properly configure it. One of the problems that occurs very commonly in auto vacuum itself is that people try to turn it off. 
they might configure auto vacuum equals off in postgresql.conf, or they might think that they're very clever and, you know, set auto vacuum nap time to a very long time, like one day. And basically, they're preventing auto vacuum from doing very much work with these kinds of configuration settings. Well, if auto vacuum doesn't do very much work, then vacuum is not getting run, and then we have all those problems that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. Assuming you don't do something like that, and please do not do something like that, then the most common problem is that auto vacuum is making poor decisions about which tables to vacuum. It either vacuums tables that really don't require vacuuming, or it doesn't vacuum tables that really do require vacuuming. So here again, we see the difference between what auto vacuum thinks it's doing, which is applying some rule, and what the human being wants, which is we'll do it at the right time. It doesn't know what the right time is. Maybe you know that because you're smarter than a computer, but it only knows the rules that it's been given. So basically, when we look at the problems that can happen with auto vacuum, I think there are basically five. Slow, stuck, spinning, skipped, and starvation. Vacuum can run for a long time, it's slow. It can run forever, it's stuck. It can get retried over and over again without doing anything, it's spinning. It can fail to process a table that it should be processing, table is skipped. Or it can be so busy doing some of the things that it's trying to do that it never gets around to some important work. That's starvation. So in the rest of the talk, what I'm going to do is step through each of these problems in somewhat more detail and talk to you about how you recognize this problem and then maybe some things that you can do to try to correct the problem. First, we'll look at the case is where vacuum is slow or it's stuck. In this case, what the user usually observes is that vacuum is running forever on my table. It's just running and running and running and running, and it's not getting completed. Well, one possibility is your table is just really big. Maybe nothing is wrong. Just be patient. Wait for it to finish. I want to mention this case because sometimes people overreact to vacuum using a lot of resources. Vacuum is important. We have to provide resources for it. We can't decide not to do it. It's not going to work. The most common reason why this happens is because vacuum has been configured to run too slowly. There's a built-in system which keeps vacuuming from running at a very high rate. It reduces the speed at which vacuum is running to reduce the resource consumption. But if we reduce the resource consumption too much, then actually we don't get enough vacuuming done. This is the single most common reason why this problem of vacuum running, for on a, running forever on a table happens. And I'll talk about it in more detail in a couple of slides. Another possibility is that vacuum is waiting for some other PostgreSQL process to complete some operation. In this case, it's actually stuck. It's not going to do any work until that other process, whatever it is, gets out of its way. In this case, we might need to kill off other processes that are accessing the ta same table so that vacuum can proceed. In the alternative, we could kill vacuum. But what will happen if we kill vacuum? Well, auto vacuum will restart it, right? Remember, Auto vacuum is very reliable, and its job is to run vacuum when it's required. If it was required before and you killed it, it's still required. It's going to get restarted. What we need to do is get the other things out of its way so that it can be finished, and then we will be in much better shape. Another possibility is that vacuum is taking a long time, not because of any problem internal to PostgreSQL, but because of something outside of PostgreSQL. For example, maybe your disk is too slow. 
And it could be that you just didn't buy enough hardware. You put a really big database on a really small machine and you just ran out of resources. Your hardware just isn't fast enough. But it can also be, and I've seen this more than one time, your disk was plenty fast when you bought it, but now it's dying. So the I.O. that was previously quite fast has now become very slow. And in that case, you'd better hurry up and move your database to a new disk, because probably in a few days or a few hours, your disk is going to die entirely. I once encountered a customer system where to read eight kilobytes of data from the disk took eight seconds. That wasn't too good. Uh, another possible reason why vacuum could be running forever is it got stuck in some kind of an infinite loop. This can't really happen with the table because the table we read from beginning to end uh, and we just go through the blocks in order. But when we read the indexes, we read them in logical order. We follow the structure of the index. But what if your index is corrupted? Maybe page number one is pointing to page number two, and page number two is pointing to page number three, and page number three points back to page number one. Well, we're going to just follow that loop around in a circle until somebody does something about that problem. Those indexes are going to be need to, need to be dropped or rebuilt with re-index, something like this. But you might wonder, how do I know which one of these problems I have? There are three main things that I like to check in these kinds of situations. First, I like to look at whether the vacuum process is consuming I.O. resources or CPU time. You can use, for example, PS to figure this out. If I see that the process is consuming CPU time, then I know it's not completely stuck. The explanation for the problem has to be something that allows for it to be continuing to do some work. Uh, but if I see it using no CPU time at all, perhaps it's waiting for something. So I can start to get some insight even just from operating system tools. Another thing I really like to do is look in PG stat activity, specifically at the weight event type columns and the weight event columns. If vacuum is using CPU time, then these columns are going to be null and we can't tell what it's doing. But if it's waiting for something, this will give us some idea of what it's waiting for. For example, if we see that the wait event is vacuum delay, then we know that that vacuum process is intentionally slowing itself down. So then we have that problem that I mentioned earlier. We need to configure it to run faster. Or uh, if we see that the wait event type is I.O., and that keeps happening, not just one time the wait event is I.O., but over and over and over again we see that, well, then we know we're waiting for the disk. PostgreSQL cannot be faster than your disk. Many customers ask for this, but I can't do it. Another really helpful thing, I think, is to check PG stat progress vacuum. This is a new view that was added a few release ago, releases ago, and it gives you the overall status of vacuum. Unfortunately, this view doesn't update if we're vacuuming the indexes. If we're vacuuming the table, then you'll see this view updating regularly, provided that uh, vacuum is actually getting something done. So this can help us rule in or out certain explanations. If we see that we're vacuuming the table, we know the problem is not with the indexes. If we see the problem is with indexes, well then, okay, maybe we have that case. So we look at these things and we try to understand what could be happening. What is making it take so much time? If you're not sure, it's a good guess that the problem is it's configured to run too slow because that is as I said before, the single most common reason why people get into trouble with this sort of thing. And the main way that you fix this problem is to raise vacuum cost limit. You can also reduce auto vacuum vacuum cost delay. Basically the way the system works 
is that every time we do an amount of work that causes us to reach the cost limit, we wait for the configured delay. So we can either make the limit bigger or we can make the delay smaller. The important thing to understand here is that as your database gets larger and busier, the vacuum cost limit needs to go up. Otherwise, you won't be able to keep up with the amount of vacuuming that you need to do. In the most recent server versions, the default settings allow auto vacuum to run at a rate of greater than 100 gigabytes an hour. But before version 12, the defaults were 10 times lower. So if you're vacuuming at a rate greater than 10 gigabytes per hour, your database doesn't have to be that huge before you can't keep up. And even at over 100 gigabytes an hour, it's possible to have a database that's large enough and busy enough that you don't keep up, in which case these values need to go up further. It's important to understand that the vacuum cost limit is shared across all workers. So if you add workers, each one goes slower. So many people try to fix this kind of problem where vacuum is going too slowly by just increasing the amount of workers. But unless you also raise the cost limit, that doesn't help. You need to raise the cost limit generally, at least according to the number of workers that you added, and often more. The cost limit is your most powerful tool for addressing this kind of problem. One defect in PostgreSQL that I really should try to fix sometime uh, is that if you change these settings, they don't take effect for auto vacuum workers that are already running only for new auto vacuum workers that are started later. So if you have some auto vacuum worker that is currently running and it's going too slow and you need to speed it up, one trick you can use in an emergency situation is hook up a debugger to the back end. There's a variable called vacuum cost active. You can set it to false, detach the debugger, and zoom. That vacuum will now start running as fast as your hardware will permit. Okay, that's all for slow and stuck. Now we're going to talk about spinning. So here, what the user sees is different. Here, it's not that the vacuum runs for a long time on the same table. It's that the same table is being processed over and over and over and over again. And here again, you need to consider the possibility that there's no real problem. If your table has a lot of write activity, it needs a lot of vacuuming. Every write that you do to that table creates also some work that vacuum needs to do. So more writes means more vacuuming. But you can't have real problems in this area. And one that I mentioned before is vacuum is failing with an error, and auto vacuum just keeps retrying it. That case is actually pretty easy. There's a bunch of reasons why that could be happening. I.O. error, some kind of database corruption, many different things. But if it's failing, there's an error message. And you can read the error message. And this should give you some idea what the problem is that you need to correct. The other reason why this usually happens is that auto vacuum keeps thinking that the table needs vacuuming. But when vacuum actually tries to process the table, nothing happens. Why does this occur? This occurs because auto vacuum is aware that there are old tuples within the table. But it doesn't realize that those tuples can't yet be cleaned up. Eventually, they will be able to be cleaned up, but we're not ready to do that yet. Auto vacuum is not aware of this. It only knows that they're there. It doesn't know when they're going to be eligible to be cleaned up. But vacuum does know, which is good, because otherwise we'd corrupt your database. Uh, and so auto vacuum says, go, go. And vacuum is like, can't do anything. So why does this happen? This happens for one of three reasons. First, you might have a long running transaction. You can check PG stat activity. You can find if there's a transaction that's been open and running for a long time. If you have that, that's probably what's preventing those old rows from being removed. Or you might have an unused replication slot. 
which you can find in PG replication slots. This is very common. Somebody removes a standby or the standby goes down and they don't clear the replication slot and then they get into this kind of trouble. Or the third way that this can happen is you might have an old prepared transaction and here you can check PG prepared XX. This is just like a long running transaction. When we prepare the transaction, it's not committed, but it's also not aborted. It's still running, even though there may no, be no process for that transaction anymore. From the point of view of the database system, that transaction is open, it's not concluded. That will eventually cause this problem if you allow that situation to persist for a long time. And then we'll talk about the last two cases together, vacuum starved or vacuum skipped. So in these cases, we see that the auto vacuum process is not running on your table at all. In the first set of cases, it was running forever. In the second set of cases, it was running over and over. Here what we see is auto vacuum seems never to be touching my table. And we wonder why is that happening? I think the best way to find out is to look at what your auto vacuum workers are doing. How many of them are being used and how actively. If all of your auto vacuum workers are being used at all times for a long time, then most likely your problem is starvation. There simply haven't been enough resources to deal with that table and so nothing is happening. But if you're not using all of your auto vacuum workers, well then there are resources available. So in that case, most likely the problem is the table was checked, but the thresholds were not met and auto vacuum decided that nothing was needed. PG stat activity can give you a lot of visibility into this, especially if you check it over time, but even if you check it just once. Whenever any customer reports this kind of problem and somebody asks for my help, the first thing I want to see is, well, what do you have auto vacuum max workers set to? Okay, let's say it's three. That's the default. How many workers do you have running? Oh, also three. That's very interesting. How long have they been running for? Oh, 18 hours. Uh-huh. So you have starvation. Those workers are too busy. They are not able to get to all of the things that need to be done. But if you just have one worker running and it's been running for five minutes, oh, well, it must be the skipped case. So what do we do about the starvation case? The important thing to remember here is that in the starvation case, there's no problem with the particular table. It's just that overall, auto vacuum doesn't have enough capacity to keep up. The solutions here are almost identical to the case where vacuum is slow. The main thing you do is raise the cost limit. Push it up there, push it way up. Don't be shy. Most configuration parameters, I advise people don't change it too much from the defaults unless you really are sure you know what you're doing. But not in this case. If you are not keeping up, just crank that vacuum cost limit way up there. Be brave. Double it, triple it, multiply it by 10. Put it way up. That will very often resolve your problem over time. Another case is maybe it's not the cost limit at all. Maybe your hardware is just too slow. Well, you'll have to get faster hardware. The only real difference between this case and the case where vacuum is slow is that in this case, it's more likely to be helpful to raise the number of workers because sometimes these starvation scenarios happen because there's a few big tables and then many smaller tables. Auto vacuum gets busy with the big tables and then the smaller tables get overlooked and raising the number of workers can help. But remember, if you raise the number of workers, what do you need to do to that cost limit? Up, up, up. If the number of workers goes up, the cost limit needs to go up by probably at least the same ratio, maybe more. What about if vacuum is skipping the table? Well, in this case, your problem is most likely caused by the configuration parameter auto vacuum vacuum scale factor. And the reason is simply that the default value of 0.2 is sometimes 
too big for a large table. For a small table, 0.2 works fine. But as the table becomes larger and larger, 0.2 can be too much, and you may need to crank that value down, down, down until the table is being vacuumed frequently enough to maintain performance. Um, you can change this value on a system-wide basis in PostgreSQL.com for by running alter system, but you can also change it for a certain table by using the alter table set syntax that I show here on the slide. That can be very useful if you want to bring this value down only for your big tables or bring it down to different levels for different tables. Another thing you can do is check whether any custom settings have been applied to a particular table. If you just run PSQL's backslash D command on this, it will show you all of the custom auto vacuum settings uh, that have been applied to the table. I have seen a few people who applied auto vacuum enabled equals false to some table, and then it didn't get vacuumed by auto vacuum. So it's good to check for this kind of thing, just to be sure. If the table is getting skipped, maybe that's because somebody told it to skip that table. The other cause of this problem is some problem with the statistic system, because the auto vacuum system is relying on the statistic system to give it accurate information about all your tables and about what's going on with all of your tables. So if the statistics data is no good, then the decisions that auto vacuum makes are not going to be any good either. I personally have not encountered this problem very frequently, but I know some other PostgreSQL hackers who have run into this problem in a lot of cases. Uh, time will not permit breaking down all of the different reasons why this could happen, because we'd have to talk about the whole way that the statistics system works, and we definitely don't have time to do that right now. Um, but if this happens, if tables are getting skipped and you suspect that maybe there's a problem with the statistics system, you might want to try a vacuum of the affected tables or perhaps the entire database, which should reset some of the statistics and see if auto vacuum begins working normally again after that. Um, if that works, then maybe you just had a one-time event of some type that messed up your statistics. For example, maybe someone manually reset them, which is not recommended. Um, but if the problem keeps coming back, then you're going to need uh, help from an expert. We have a few of those at EDB. Um, or uh, maybe uh, at, at least somebody who's familiar with the, the kinds of problems that uh, can occur here. Uh, maybe you'll need help from another talk, but in this talk, I can't go into that. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that really tables are never going to get skipped forever. Even if you set auto vacuum equals off, you set auto vacuum nat time equals one day, you set the uh, cost limit really low, you set the scale factor really high, you do all of the things you possibly can to try to prevent auto vacuum from running on a table, it will eventually run anyway. So no table is going to get starved forever. But by the time it actually runs, your table may be so badly bloated that the system is unusable, or you may be so far behind on XIDs that you're refusing write transactions. So just like with the other problems we mentioned, you want to try to respond to these vacuum issues quickly because it's, uh, it's like paying the mortgage or paying the rent. If you don't keep up, the problem gets worse and worse. You don't want to wait when you have these problems. You want to address them promptly. That's about all I have for today. Uh, EDB is hiring. Uh, please join us if you're interested in doing that. Uh, and thank you very much for coming to the talk. Uh, if there are any questions, and we have the time, I can take them. Hi. Hi. Uh, in theory, is there a possibility to make it more intelligent, uh, dot walk vacuum? And maybe, you know, it's just still one vacuum thread uh, or one vacuum worker per table at a time, right? Yeah. So if a table is really busy and large, is there any uh, possibility, uh, you know, or scope? Is it a good idea? There is always a possibility of making it better. Uh, so the, there was, I think, two parts to that question. One was about making uh, auto vacuum itself smarter, and the other is about making vacuum run in parallel. Yeah. There is now a facility to run a manual vacuum with some parallelism, 
but the kinds of parallelism that you can get there are quite limited, and that facility is also not used by auto vacuum. I completely agree with you that the auto vacuum algorithm should be made smarter. In particular, I think that the fact that the cost limit is a hard setting uh, and it doesn't scale based on the size of your database, you have to tune it, I think that stinks. Uh, so I would like to do something about that at some point in time. Uh, my boss is over there. Uh, no, well, he's not my boss, but he's one of my bosses, so you can talk to him about that. I definitely agree something should be done about that. The other, there's a couple of others that I mentioned in the talk that would also be really good to address. So yes, definitely agreed that it would be nice to, to make it smarter. And is there any way to uh, you know, easily identify the long-running transaction which is blocking? Yeah, uh, it's very easy to see from PGStat activity. You can see when the query started. You can see when the transaction started. You can see how old the X-min and X-ID of the backend are in there. So if you look at PGStat activity, it's quite easy to see in there. If you're not familiar with it, you can check the documentation or ask somebody. But it's not hard to find the long-running transactions. Thank you. Panas. Oh. The cost limit, right? So basically what I understand, the cost limit, if we raise it, it will uh, do a vacuuming for a certain cost and then pause. It won't uh, you know, say that, okay, I'm done. I close this now. I'm, I'll come back for the rest of the part later on. Yeah, it doesn't do that. So yeah. is it possible, right? You know, we do it that way. With that way, you know, we'll be done. Okay, this part of the uh, table is the bloat is done. You know, we don't we need, don't need to bother about coming back to it again and again, right? Yeah. So pausing vacuum and resuming it later doesn't really work, um, and the reason is because. The way that vacuum actually works, there's some cleanup that can be done by just looking directly at the table, and there's some work that requires looking at the table and indexes in combination. And the work that can be done just by looking at the table, actually it's not just done by vacuum, it's also done by your queries automatically uh, as things are happening in the system. But the work that requires looking at both the table and the indexes you have to read every index in its entirety before you get any benefit. So you don't want to do that for small amounts of tuples at a time. You want to collect a big batch of tuples from the table and then scan the indexes for all of those tuples at the same time. Otherwise, it's not very efficient. So I think maybe parallelism can help us there. Doing better with parallelism uh, within vacuum can be a way forward there. But uh, I don't think that we can make any progress by a suspend and resume kind of a thing here. Of course, some other PostgreSQL hacker may have a different opinion. That's only mine. <laughs> Hi, sir. Uh, like, I have one question. Like, uh, Please speak loudly. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have a uh, two big tables, which is around two terabyte and three, three terabyte tables. Okay, so there there were some bad jobs running parallelly. So can we skip auto vacuum particular uh, uh, time frame? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean. Um, if you have a workload that is very intense at certain times of the day or the week, and other times it's not intense, uh, there are things that you can do to improve the situation. But you have to think about it as running vacuum sooner rather than later. If during your busy period, you're only going to require one vacuum, well, maybe you can manually run that vacuum before the busy period starts and then get through the busy period before it's again required. But if your busy period is long enough that you need two or three vacuums in there, well, you can't skip them and wait until the end. I mean, you could, but probably then what will happen is you're going to have bloat and performance will be terrible. So I definitely think it's a good idea if you know your workload spikes every morning, you can run a vacuum overnight by hand to get as much of the work out of the way as possible in advance. And there are even some settings you can tune to make that more effective. But people who want to say, well, I'll postpone the vacuum until after the busy period, that tends to result in uh, somebody calling support. 
All right. Uh, that is all the time we have for the questions. Thank you, Robert.